There are a number of threats facing birds of prey. One of which, of course, is the enormity of humans today, the various developments that they need, and that we can include cities, towns, villages, farmlands, ranchland, rangeland. One looming threat is climate change. This year, some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded in the Northern Hemisphere have taken place. The Sahara is an extremely hazardous crossing at the best of times, but one has to ask, are all the migratory raptors and the birds that they follow capable of crossing that immensely now hot desert and being able to survive that crossing? We really don't know. Climate change, of course, is going to change everything that we know in Africa, from rainfall patterns to dry weather. We really don't know what the consequences will be, but one thing's for sure, climate change is real and is going to have a negative impact upon birds of prey and wildlife in general. Poisoning is another threat. We're very familiar with the poisoning of large carnivores that ends up poisoning vultures. Often forgotten is the poisoning of tawny eagles, steppe eagles, and battler eagles, and other birds of prey that also scavenge. Overlooked also is the poisoning of species such as red-billed quailia, and the desert locust, with poisons that if ingested by a bird of prey will inevitably kill them. This happens at rates that we are unfamiliar with. It's often done across Africa on broad scale. We're unfamiliar really with the extent of the poisoning of red-billed quailia and locusts and unable to keep ahead of that loss. But it is certainly extremely significant to the killing of small migratory falcons and other resident raptors that will eat opportunistically dead and dying quailia and locusts. Poisoning in the famous way of, say, silent spring of the organochlorines, making eggshell thinning. These are actually being largely overlooked across Africa. We just simply don't have the means to examine at that close detail the eggshell thinning and reproductive disorders that many of the pesticides, not just the DDT, PCBs, and other organochlorines can do, but now an incredible cocktail of different kinds of other pesticides being used. We really don't know the subtle changes in reproduction that may be taking place. Of the numbers of threats facing birds of prey, certainly the developments of humans, the human expansion, human population growth has changed landscapes from natural landscapes into man-made landscapes and at the expense of obviously of most wildlife and raptors are no different. We can see massive landscapes today traveling thousands of kilometers whereby we do not see nature as it used to be. Thus, there are very few raptors. There are some raptors, however, that profit. And these are called synanthropic animals. They like animals. They like man-made landscapes. They like farmlands and they profit from them. You plant gum trees, exotics, and you've got black sparrowhawks nesting in them, bat hawks, airs hawk eagles. It's actually quite incredible how resilient birds are and how opportunistic some of them can be. But not all of them. Probably about 25% of raptors can cope with a certain density of humans and profit, but often at the expense of other raptors, more sensitive species. That is a huge, significant impact upon raptors, not only human development, but those raptors that actually like humans, but that to the exclusion of others. Other synanthropic animals which have taken over in human landscapes can have massive effect upon raptor populations, and they include famously baboons, Egyptian geese. Baboons can multiply literally many times greater than their natural population and they have a devastating effect upon wildlife in general, in particular raptors, who have nests 
that baboons climb to and destroy their reproductive success year after year. One can go on about the various different species of animals that can actually interfere with the natural, normal holding capacity of raptors. The other thing that we need to talk about in threats, persecution. Human persecution in Africa is really extremely high. In many cases, raptors are just considered as pests, like snakes. Those working in snake conservation will lament that persecution is extremely high to the point whereby it can result in the extinction of species just from that single cause alone. Now, unfortunately, in Africa, very few people see the benefits of birds of prey and certainly persecution in every form, from shooting, from trapping, to deliberate poisoning, to cutting down nest trees, is extremely important. We're talking about electrocution and how it happens. Um, this bird here, the tarsus, um, is very poorly vasculated, so it has very little amount of, uh, there's virtually nothing in the way of flesh, as you imagine on a chicken's leg. It's just basically bare bone and flesh. But there is one blood vessel, a, a large one, that goes on the inside, and there's another one on the inside here too. And on occasion, what I've seen is birds' feet, which look perfectly okay, it's that the blood vessel is completely blackened. And I've actually been able to sort of milk out coagulated bits of blood. In effect, what's happened is the hemoglobin, which is full of iron, has actually made that short circuit. So as that touches a negative or a positive, the electricity has to be conducted through that leg, uh, obviously to electrocute the bird. In a way, these are so small that it's like having a five amp fuse. This fuse will burn out before the bird does. When you go to the wing, which this has now got a lot of more flesh on it, and if there's a direct contact with a, you know, the much more fleshy part of the wing, um, that is like a 30 amp fuse. So when that gets the, hits the power line, um, it was conducting through the wing and then usually through the foot on the opposite side. So this will burn out before this one burns out and this is why they often fly off alive. When you actually start thinking about the the way the electrical current is going to flow, you're going to make up a decision that more birds get shocked. That's the terminology, the right terminology, rather than electrocuted. Electrocuted means fatal. So more birds get shocked than they do get electrocuted. The trouble is, is those birds who get shocked die later. And that would be about 90% of the birds who get killed were not able to actually count and enumerate. Most of them fly off, even 200 kilometers away, and then die later, like this one. This is a kind of problem we have. These are the concrete poles with reinforced. So basically they look like this on top. They're like that on top, they're slightly cone-shaped, and then on the top they have these reinforcing rods that literally can stick out whether or not they've actually put a cap of cement over the top. Sometimes there isn't a cap, sometimes there is, but it doesn't really matter because when you put a trowel over these reinforcing rods and put the cement on, you'll be leaving a gap as little as, a, sometimes as much as a millimeter. So when the first rains come, you'll get, this will start to become ferrous. This therefore becomes in effect a hot plate. Anything sitting on the top of this is in direct contact with earth. So something touching this to that, which is live, will get electrocuted. Something touching this to that, ditto. And of course here we have the phase to phase contact that can kill them or the phase-to-phase -phase contact there. This is a rather simplified drawing. What you have here, this is a slightly longer distance from here to here, or the other way around here. So this is a concrete metal cross arm. Anything going between phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-earth, phase-to-earth, phase-to-earth will die. Anything on this wooden one, this is a much bigger ceramic insulator, and actually the birds in comparison, sometimes even an auger buzzard would be about just as big as this. 
the insulators can be very big indeed. So that would be a comparative size. Therefore, it could just head could touch the, the live wire. However, this is wood and that's less conductive than steel. Only when this is damp or when it's raining will there be a huge voltage crossover and a short circuit would be sufficient to kill it. Often you get birds who suffer from an electric shock and in theory we're supposed to term things that suffer from a shock are differently to an electrocution. Electrocution means immediate death. Shock means, in this case, steady necrosis of the wingtip and leg, which later leads to death. And again, that's one of the aspects of mortality that's very rarely recorded. We see, as rehabbers, a lot of birds coming in with missing limbs that die over weeks, and they can literally walk away or fly away up to literally 200 kilometers away. And virtually all studies done about electrocution overlooks those, what I call, sub-mortalities. Makes no sense. Only if you really are in the rehab business do you get to see all those birds. So those are some of the threats. The thing is, what can you do? Well, one thing, don't be complacent and think it's the job of other people to do. It isn't, it's your job. For example, something as simple as water tanks, open reservoirs, drown thousands of animals every year, particularly in large farms, ranches, conservancies, and even national parks. They should be covered. Poorly made water holes that are sheer walled also kill thousands of animals, particularly birds and birds of prey. That alone can be one of the major causes of mortality for martial eagles and vultures, such as once in Namibia. Lobby your government to stop electrocuting birds of prey and other wildlife needlessly. Not a single bird needs to be electrocuted. Make a noise about it. In particular, we may suffer from power cuts, often the result of electrocuting a bird that may just short circuit. Go and do something about it. Talk at your county government level or your senior government level to make electrocution in particular a non-issue. Make those power lines safe. If you see large pane glass windows, in particular on lodges, wildlife areas, the scenic panoramic views, but they are constantly being hit by a barrage of birds who die on impact, do something about it, and a small little decal is not enough. Make sure that these buildings go in with those ideas in mind. Even the smallest amount of persecution, if you see people throwing a stone at an owl, just try to stop it. If you see a bird of prey that is in need of help, it's got a broken wing, don't just disregard it, but try to find somebody who can look after it and take care of it. So people may ask, why do you bother about individuals? Well, in some places, only individuals are left. For example, in Kenya, it would be extremely difficult to imagine that there's more lamagars, bearded vultures, than the fingers of one hand. If you save one, you're saving a significant proportion of the entire population. And journeys always begin with a single step anyway. The idea of actually getting physically involved means that you become part of that lobby group, part of that group of people who are concerned. The very few who are actually going to have a real deep concern and probably going to be an educator yourself. Get involved in Birds of Prey, get interested. Birds of Prey cannot be confined to the tiny areas under protection of our national parks and conservancies today. They can only survive if they're allowed to survive alongside you.